The Islamic Republic of Iran warns it is one step away from building a nuclear weapon that could be unleashed quickly on Israel or the United States. Remarks posted to an Iranian Revolutionary Guard social media site recently boasted the regime could, quote, turn New York into ruins and hell. Here to provide some insights on this is author Raymond Ibrahim. His new book is Defenders of the West, the Christian Heroes Who Stood Against Islam. Raymond, Western leaders keep trying to reach an accommodation with Iran, but I'm assuming you believe it's futile. Uh, why do you believe a war between the West and Iran is probably inevitable? Because it has been going on since time immemorial. Um, with the rise of Islam in the 7th century, whether it was a Sunni or Shia manifestations, they essentially launched what they called and understood as a jihad on the rest of the non-Muslim world, which adjoined which at the time was actually mostly Christian. And so, and they conquered and they continued conquering until they swallowed up three quarters of the original Christian territory until Europe was all you had left. And that was even constantly bombarded. And Iran is, is governed by a theocracy. So that to me is ultimately the most troubling aspect. And the recent news that Al-Qaeda leader Ayman Zawahiri was killed in a U.S. drone strike. That's just one man, but I guess there may be thousands of al-Qaeda jihadists in Afghanistan now? Based on your research, what's your prediction about what will happen in Afghanistan now? I'm assuming the Taliban, other Islamic extremists view this as only a temporary setback. After all, they were kind of able to drive the U.S. crusaders out of Afghanistan. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the small news, the insignificant but political symbolic news is you killed Ayman Zawahri, who was one of the two faces of 9-11, him, him and Osama bin Laden. But he really was a kind of marginalized character right now. He was in his early 70s. He just he didn't hear much about him. He's just a propagandistic figure and so forth. And um, I've been studying this because if you go back from the first killings of Abu, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, if you remember him, he was the original face of ISIS. And then, you know, all the way down, all these various leaders, including Osama bin Laden. I remember when Osama bin Laden died, you know, Peter Bergen and other uh, CNN analysts, Zakaria, uh, Fareed Zakaria, they came up and literally said, that, well, we can now declare the war on terror is over. Because as if as if it's all embodied in one man, but it's not. Um, you know, it's like, uh, it, to give it a quick analogy, you know, the Hercules myth where he fights the Hy Hydra monster and every time he cuts off one head, two more sprout out in its place. And that's really what's going on. It doesn't matter if you kill this or that terrorist, as, as we've seen. If you go back, you know, you've always had heads of jihad. Arguably, we can begin with Muhammad himself, a prophet, and even he died and the jihad continued. So I think it's more important to understand the existential ideological nature of the war we're in and stop being caught up, again, for political points and symbolism on, on the Biden administration's behalf with killing this or that leader. Okay, in your book, you look at eight heroes who defended Christendom. In the first chapter, I found your account of Godfrey and the First Crusade fascinating. And I don't think the average person realizes that the First Crusade was actually a response to the slaughter of innocent Christians, many of them women and children. Tell us more about this. Exactly, Gary. Um, again, the problem is we always, when we hear about any kind of religious Muslim, conf uh, Christian Muslim conflict, the historical aspect, immediately what comes to mind most Americans and Westerners is the Crusades. And then the Crusades are presented in a vacuum. We're not told that, well, they are actually responding to centuries worth of attacks from Muslims in the name of Islam on fellow Christians. And, include, and right before the uh, Crusades, you actually had the Turks devastating Anatolia, Asia Minor, which is today Turkey, killing, according to the sources, hundreds of thousands of Christians, burning literally over thousands, many thousands of churches, transforming them into mosques. And that's what initiated the call of the First Crusade. And one of the First Crusaders is, of course, Godfrey of Bouillon, the Duke. And we have time for another one. Fast forward to the mid-15th century. How about the hero of Albania, George Castriati, also known as Skanderbreg? Uh, he suffered betrayal even from his own nephew, Hamza, but he enjoyed many yeah. battle victories during more than two decades uh, when he and his troops were vastly outnumbered, I guess, by invading Turks, the Turks again. Tell us more about him. Absolutely. All of these characters, I should just say, you know, I read about eight and beginning with Godfrey and then we end up uh, with Skanderbeg and even Vlad the Impaler. Uh, and I try to give a corrective, you know, of the true nature of who he is and who he was. And by the way, Godfrey is one of the most interesting characters, um, you know, very colorful life along the First Crusade. But he's also famous for saying he became the first king of the, of the kingdom of Jerusalem, but he refused to be called king. And he said, I refuse to wear a crown of gold where my savior wore a crown of thorns. 
So very pious men who were driven by just war theory. Now you fast forward, um, you know, about four or five centuries, and now you have Skanderbeg in Albania, and now we have a whole different manifestation of Islamic Jihad. You have the Ottoman Turks going into the Balkans and devastating it and so forth. And his life is really amazing. He was actually kidnapped as a youth, trained to be an Islamic slave soldier, rose to the highest echelons of the military due to his prowess, and then waged war for over a quarter of a century against the Ottomans by defending his, his tiny nation. And, and the odds were ridiculous. Usually he'd have 10,000 men, the Ottomans would have over 100,000. But he actually beat them in every single confrontation for, for a quarter of a century. Um, and he's one of the most really, they call him the Albanian Braveheart. So really all of these uh, characters are fascinating and it's amazing that we don't have movies about them. But I think I know why, because they were actually very much driven by their Christian piety, believe it or not. And um, Hollywood won't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Okay, a book that should be on the reading list for every world history buff and in colleges and universities. The book is Defenders of the West, the Christian Heroes Who Stood Against Islam. Raymond Ibrahim, thanks for providing those insights. We appreciate it, Raymond. Thanks very much, Gary.